good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Welcome to uh, this webinar, um, which is all about the recycling of lighting lamps, um, which is an important uh, waste in the uh, we stream uh, because it is quite complicated and uh, it is quite a large waste stream to handle um, because there is, as you can imagine, there is light everywhere and there are millions and millions of lamps uh, around the world and we will need to manage them safely and properly. So I will um, start with uh, just giving you a brief overview of the types of lamps. Just need to go down. So I'm going, this is just a few examples. There are many, many different types of lamps um, out there. Um, so uh, there's not enough time or enough space here to show every lamp type, but these are the most common lamps that you will find uh, in households and businesses and um, in industry today. Uh, so I've listed here uh, six examples. Um, the first one on the left is your high intensity discharge lamp, which is short for, uh, HID short for that. And this particular lamp is uh, greater than 400 watts. Uh, these are typically used in high industrial areas or in stadiums uh, because they pro provide a very high light output. And having said that, because they have a high uh, and good quality light output, they contain more mercury. Um, so they contain in excess of 400 milligrams of mercury per lamp. And it also has some electronics. So the part that you see that is yellow, that is the quartz um, capsule inside, and that is where the mercury is contained, and that is elemental mercury. So one needs to be careful when handling uh, the lamp that you don't break that section. And then further to the right next to it is the all, everyone would know this is the common linear fluorescent tube, uh, which contains uh, mercury vapor, which depending on uh, manufacturer and the origin of where the lamp was uh, made, can vary between 15 to 20 milligrams of mercury. And it also has uh, some small electronics uh, on the ends in the, in the end caps. Um, and then next to that is your halogens, uh, which is a common household lamp. Um, they are mostly being replaced by LED lamps now, but uh, uh, it's very similar to LEDs where there is electronics and some contain lead solder to hold all the, the wires and pieces together. So they also need to be carefully managed as waste. Uh, and then your, uh, at the bottom row on the left is your linear LEDs, your uh, uh, LED tubes, and these LEDs uh, commonly con they all contain uh, electronics such as a small PC board, and obviously your diodes and some wires and so forth. Um, and then the diodes um, can contain other elements. And the warmer the lamp is, or the the more red or more orange or yellow the lamp is, it contains metalloid which is arsenic, uh, so it is also needs to be managed carefully. Then next to that is also uh, common to us uh, in South Africa, and especially in Africa, I'm not sure in the rest of the world if you still see these, but this is the compact fluorescent lamp or the CFL. And these contain also, depending on the manufacturer and the origin of uh, these lamps, uh, between three to eight milligrams of mercury in vapor form and also some electronics uh, in there. And we will go in a little bit more detail later about uh, what it looks like inside. Um, and then you have your sodium vapor lamps. These you will commonly see in 
big warehouses and industries, uh, big areas where uh, you would need uh, strong directional light. Um, so this is your sodium vapor lamp, which can also contain mercury vapor in there, or um, if it doesn't contain uh, mercury vapor, it has other uh, gases inside there. And either way, uh, these lamps are explosion risks. So one needs to be careful that uh, when you handle these, uh, if you break the glass, it, it makes a large explosive sound and it explodes with glass going everywhere. And um, they also have been known to cause fires on landfill because um, the sodium has a reaction with water uh, and so forth, which can, which can, can cause combustion. So they also need to be handled carefully. And these, uh, the ones that contain mercury vapor contain between 50 to 200 milligrams of mercury and electronics inside there. I'm going to move to the next slide, where I've got two examples of common lamps that we as uh, people could see every day. It's your ADGU-10, the new lamps that we'll see on the market, and also the compact red lamp that I just spoke about earlier. So we will go through the LEDGU-10. Uh, this lamp uh, it, 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 it has been dismantled, as you can see. And what I would like to uh, highlight is uh, for a small, this is a very small lamp, and you get different sizes of these lamps. And the electronic parts grow in size as the lamp gets bigger. So this is a small lamp. Um, and this lamp has uh, the, the electronic components in here, which you'll see your your wires, and, and then also your connecting pieces. And then this part here is the small printed circuit board. And of course, I want to highlight the uh, capacitor there. So the capacitor is quite small, but if you look at orders of magnitude with millions of these lamps uh, out in the world today, that is quite a few capacitors. So we always... Uh, remove those um, and send them to uh, to a, 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 a big H or a hazardous landfill or into smelters or whatever they uh, who will take those safely. Uh, I will then move over to the compact fluorescent lamp. This is an explosion diagram. And also, I want to highlight here, this is your fluorescent glass tube uh, section, which uh, will be um, treated and, and the mercury vapor recovered out of that. Uh, but inside the CFL, you have a lot of electronic components, uh, your wires, your end cap, your plastic. And this is BFR plastic because it's a flame retardant plastic. So one has to also send that off to landfill. Uh, the Capacitor, I want to highlight there also, capacitors are also found. So in all electronic lamps you, with, that contain uh, electronic components and that, you will always find capacitors. And as I said, the larger the lamp goes, the bigger the capacitor. And sometimes these electronic driving um, devices or the, the, the electronics that drive the lamp sit outside of the lamp, so it's not integrated with the lamp. They sit in the, in the luminaire or the fitting or as an external component, and normally those contain very large capacitors. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the storage of lamps. So that is just a basic, uh, what I gave you was a basic introduction into some common lamps, and now we're going to go into the storage of lamps uh, if you if you operate a consolidation or storage facility uh, or pre-treatment, um, and even in the treatment facility, I'm going to talk about containment and storage. And, and containment would be at uh, the customer site. So this is an example of bad practice that we have uh, found in in uh, South Africa. 
uh, very bad practice for storage and containment. Uh, uh, at, this is at one business in Johannesburg. Um, can you see my arrow, Elizabeth? Yes, yes, we can. See okay. Yeah. Okay. So where I'm pointing now is this is a very bad example of containment and storage. It creates a huge risk for people walking by here um, because these lamps can break easily. They can cause health and safety and environmental um, risks. So that is an example. Over here is an example of uh, lamps that have been crushed into a, a, a 210 liter drum. Um, this drum was left open and exposed to the elements. Uh, so uh, this obviously was exposed to rain and it was full of water and it uh, arrived at our facility in this way. And, and, and I'm sure, uh, you know, common sense is you cannot treat this as it is there because of all the water and the dirt. So uh, this had to get sent to a landfill. Uh, sorry, I uh, just need to go back here. Uh, we, um, so we would, uh, I will go into more detail on, on better practice, but uh, we try and avoid the use of drums uh, for lamp waste because it creates a whole lot of additional headaches and problems. So yeah, in this drawing here is another example of bad practice where this was stored underneath the parking area uh, with some some illegal hand drum crusher, drum top crusher here. Uh, so all of this um, ha we had to clean up and educate uh, the customer on uh, not to use this equipment and also how to store and uh, how to contain correctly. Over here, this is also bad practice. Uh, your wheelie bins, uh, wheelie bins are not designed for, for uh, any long fluorescent tube or LED tube. Uh, they stick out, they are a risk to people that, um, that will work with these uh, these bins or empty it into other uh, containers or, or trucks. So this is also discouraged uh, to, to, to store or put lamps uh, in, a, in a container like that. So I'm going to move on to the next slide now, which will go into a bit more of the container, uh, best container and designs of containers and containment. So here you will see um, an, uh, an example of two containers. This is a good design and this is a bad design. You can see there's uh, the container is flat on the floor. It is very thin cardboard. Uh, it uh, does not have a lot of wall strength. Uh, the water uh, that on the floor um, soaks into this and causes it to weaken even more. So when you try and carry this, it falls apart. Um, the lid is very flimsy, so it's really a bad design. Where this uh, design here, it's uh, off the floor, so no uh, no uh, contaminants or water can can enter the, the container. It has a, a proper lid that can open um, for putting the the lamps inside and also has a very strong wall thickness, um, which has good wall strength and integrity to keep the lamps in place and intact. So one needs to ensure that your containers are, and this is containers that you would typically put on your client site um, at, um, for them to put their old lamps into before you collect them to take them to the storage facility. Or, uh, or to the uh, uh, treatment plant. So this is a, a very high grade uh, steel um, that is mostly used for exterior applications. So lamps that are stored outside or exposed to wind or whatever, they, they would get there, uh, stored there or in high traffic areas. Um, the steel containers 
are very, very popular um, in the mines and so forth. So, and they also have feet that keep the container off the ground. Then you have the uh, uh, cardboard, the high durability, high strength cardboard, which you can see with the wall thickness. As I pointed out in the previous picture, it's a corrugated thick cardboard, so it cannot be pierced easily or, or torn easily. And also off the ground with feet, and they come in various sizes, um, and then, which is fit for purpose. And then another option uh, that we use is the, can I just, uh, uh, another option that we use is the uh, molded PET plastic containers. Uh, these are also very similar to the steel, very high strength and durable, and also can be used in various uh, areas that have high traffic and so forth. So, um, the important things that you need to consider when designing or uh, look, looking at containerization, you need to consider the application. You need to think if it's uh, the, the, the customer or the place where you're going to collect, if they have large or small volumes and you would size the container appropriately. Uh, is it going to be kept inside, indoors or outdoors? Then you would use the correct container. Is there going to be high traffic areas, like in industrial areas? You need to keep that in mind and uh, to use uh, higher strength, higher durability. Um, you need to consider the exchange frequency. How often are the labs going to be exchanged uh, so that you can plan that in and size your container accordingly? And then you also need to look at the strength and durability to suit the application. Um, the small one over here is, is, is that I'm pointing to there is very good for offices, um, uh, for smaller volumes, and the larger containers are for big industries or larger um, volumes. Then another thing that you need to consider is that the, the containers are made from recyclable materials, such as cardboard, steel, or aluminium. These, these steel uh, the containers can also be made in aluminium. Uh, and recyclable PET. So all these containers on this, these pictures here, at the end of life, all of these containers can be recycled. Non-recyclable containers are containers that are typically made of fiberglass or BFR plastics. Uh, so those are the type of containers you need to avoid because they, they do not, um, they, you cannot recycle them at the end of life. And um, these ones are perfect for and fit for purpose. So the next slide is just going to show some examples uh, the best practice of uh, containerization, as I pointed out, the smaller ones are for small volumes of less than 200, perfect for office blocks and so forth and households. Uh, the, stack, the, the, the containers uh, are stackable, so it can be uh, good for space saving. Uh, the large volume uh, containers, these, con these containers it can hold up to one ton um, or typically uh, the weight of these are around 350 to 400 kilograms. So a large volume container that holds around 10,000 lamps, um, depending on the type and the size, but uh, 10,000 lamps, so it's a high volume. And then the medium volume containers hold less than 1,000, uh, between 800 and 1,000, depending on the type of tube and the diameter of the tube. Um, will determine whether it's between 800 or 1,000. And then, of course, you can have a, a section for CFLs. Um, and this is also for factories, small businesses, uh, that this will be suitable for. So the best practice storage guidelines, uh, I want to, there are more than these points, but these are the most important ones uh, for storage. Now, this is if you have a storage facility, pretreatment facility, um, or storage at the at the treatment facility. You need to follow these guidelines. So the storage facility must be large enough to fit the volume, um, with adequate space for walkways and waste moving trolleys and equipment. 
It must be dry and protected from the elements with power flow to impermeable concrete floors, lockable with access control. Uh, that's very important because uh, many lamps, as you know, contain hazardous material, so you don't want anybody gaining access and messing around with the waste. And you must have appropriate HSE controls, such as fire extinguishers and emergency procedures. The stack height of your containers must not exceed three containers, and that is a, um, a, a, a safety standard set worldwide. Um, weighing equipment must be available for waste entering or leaving the storage facility, or treatment facility, including separated packaging and fraction. The mass balance and records must be kept for all waste in and out, and all containers must be labeled with information such as content, type, and weight. For example, these containers, you see they have labels on them, and it will state uh, fluorescent tubes, and it will have been weighed so that when it reaches the treatment facility, they know what they're receiving and what the weight is, and they check the weight when it uh, comes into the treatment facility to ensure that there's been no losses on the way. Okay, so other container handling factors to consider is to use forklifts for loading and offloading trucks and for heavy or large containers. Uh, do not attempt to do this manually by hand. It is very dangerous and um, not good for employees uh, to, to handle these containers. You need to have appropriate equipment for loading and offloading uh, trucks and vehicles. Um, the use of pallet jacks for moving smaller containers with lamp waste in the storage and treatment facility. So to move them around, don't slide them all over the place or have people uh, carrying them. Um, so you need to have the, the right uh, move um, uh, pallet jacks. And then the drum trolleys, for moving drums with lamp waste in storage and treatment facilities. Uh, it is not advisable to push these around or roll them around. It's dangerous um, and it can be harmful and, and hurt people. So um, it's best to use the appropriate equipment there. And do not exceed the weight rating of each item of carrying equipment and ensure staff do not lift heavy items. So all of these equipment will have a specific weight, maximum weight rating, so do not exceed those uh, for safety reasons, and obviously for health and environmental reasons too. And then I'm going to go now on to the transportation of waste lamps. So the transportation of lamps, you can do it in uh, two ways. Uh, it's a light delivery vehicle for smaller volumes, so your smaller containers that you that I showed you previously, um, light delivery vehicles uh, for smaller ones are, are ideal. Um, they need to be registered according to the lo to your local hazardous transport regulation, and should be satellite tracked 24/7. Uh, so you always know where the waste is, and 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 you can track it at any time to see where the vehicles are. Okay, then for larger bulk volumes, you use your large hazard vehicle, and these should also be registered according to local hazardous transport regulations, and it also is advisable to have them tracked 24-7. So these were the high volume containers that you saw in the previous picture uh, when we looked at the best practice storage guidelines. They all contain uh, lamps that were sorted and packed in here in the pre-treatment uh, pre or sorting facility, consolidation facility, and these lamps are all ready now to, they're labeled and they're all ready now to be transported to the treatment site or the treatment facility. So they've all been packed from smaller comp containers into the large transport containers, which is on this truck. Um, these trucks also have got uh, um, load centers, so if there's uh, any um, instability, the truck can compensate so that these, uh, these lamps are not shaken around or, or there's no risk of breakage or from, uh, from vibrations or shaking around on road surfaces. So 
And the transportation of crushed lamps in drums, uh, they still, this still happens today. We have drums that need to be transported. And these are the based on the UN transport regulations for drums. Drums should not be double stacked, as you see here. Uh, this is unsafe and it goes against the UN transport regulations um, because it can create uh, unstable, uh, unstable loads and um, the drums are not designed uh, to be stacked like this. So this is not advisable, so single stack only. Um, and if you look, if you look at this, even though a drum can contain maybe, uh, depending on the type of crusher, between three to five hundred lamps in here. Uh, if you look at the the, the 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 volume that can be stored uh, transported in drums, is much less than here because here you are using the entire volume of the truck, um, and each of these containers contain up to eight thousand to ten thousand lamps. And you're, here you see all the space wastage, uh, even with double stacks, you cannot get the same efficiencies, packing efficiencies. So uh, we, all, we always try and um, encourage um, people or our, our customers to move away from drums because it's unnecessary. But uh, some people prefer using drums and we need to follow the transport regulations. So the, U, the, the UN rated drums for crushed lamp transportation, there are drums that are rated for mercury containing or crushed lamps. Uh, these ones are quite common as you see there. Uh, these are quite common and they're the incorrect drums that get used. So you'll see they only have two ridges, they're cheaper, their wall thickness is um, a lot thinner and uh, they have lower uh, 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 strength in terms of uh, the amount of weight and, 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 and uh, content it can carry. So these are not rated for crushed lamps. The ones that are rated for crushed lamps are the ones that contain the, the drums that have more than three ridges here. Um, these drums cost more. They have a higher or thicker wall strength. Um, these, when you transport with these drums, uh, they must be sealed and must be labeled with the UN, the, the appropriate UN code for crushed lamps. And also the maximum weight of these drums must not exceed 180 kilograms. They're designed for 180 kilograms and no more. Okay, and I'm going to move on to the next picture. Uh, I'm going to talk about safety and PPE requirements for lamp handling. I'm just doing a summary. There's a, uh, there's a lot more detail that can go into the PPE requirements depending on what you're doing, uh, what, uh, what, uh, if you're doing a cleanup or if you are doing treatment or, um, but it depends on the, uh, on the type of work that you're doing. These are the minimum requirements. So especially when you're working with uh, glass lamps or mercury vapor lamps. Uh, you need to ensure that you have appropriate respirators with eye protection. You'll see here you have safety glasses and this is just a, a respirator with safety glasses um, and activated carbon filter cartridges. Um, and these cartridges need to be rated for inorganic mercury vapors, not organic. I mean that's very important to remember because the the, the mercury inside lamps is in the organic, inorganic form. Um, so these must be suitable for use uh, where there's potential exposure to the inorganic mercury vapors, such as fluorescent lamps, or to clean up spills, uh, and also to uh, protect the, 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 the worker from any potential um, health risk there. And then also to use cut proof gloves um, and for arm protection, and you can, uh, which is cut proof suitable for protecting against cuts resulting from broken lamps or a lamp breaking during handling. So all of these are, uh, are rated for um, cut proof so that should a lamp break, uh, the, 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 
worker or the person is protected. So ensure that you also have full cleanup procedures that could be place for breakages or spills that may occur during storage, treatment, or transportation. So vehicles all carry uh, uh, small spill kits um, in case there's spillages during loading or uh, breakages uh, during loading or offloading. Um, there needs to be a full cleanup procedure in place uh, at all of these facilities, storage, pretreatment, or treatment, and transportation. And then, very important, do not use a vacuum cleaner for broken fluorescent lamp residues. Um, and follow the proper cleanup procedures as the mercury vapor will just be drawn in and dis distributed through the vacuum's exhaust into the air. So, um, do not use a vacuum cleaner for any mercury containing lamp or any lamp that has hazardous material inside. So, and also then lastly, ensure that all staff that handle lamps during collection, transportation, and treatment are adequately trained so that they're all aware of the risks and how to handle lamps uh, during these processes. I'm now going to go into the equipment for recycling of lamps. So, this is advanced treatment uh, where uh, or specialized treatment, sorry, specialized treatment. Um, this is a typical lamp recycling plant. This one is specifically uh, that Redlight uses as a Swedish uh, plant. It's a dry crush and separation technology. It's, it's, I think there is only two in the world uh, that, that operate, uh, that manufacture dry separation technologies. There are other technologies, but they are wet technologies that require the addition of chemicals. Um, which we feel wasn't uh, creating more waste, so we opted for the dry crush and separation technology. It has a high processing capacity of lamps per hour. For, for example, ours has uh, 800 kilograms per hour. Um, the processes of all lamp, it processes all lamp types, uh, of varying sizes and shapes. Um, the operating conditions of the plant must meet environmental health and safety standards. Uh, the processing efficacy of the plant must ensure that all the recovered fractions are clean for reuse in other applications. Uh, so what's the point of uh, spending and investing in this big machine if your fractions are not clean for reuse? Um, so therefore, tests must be conducted on all recovered materials in certified laboratories. And test results are used for proving the suitability and cleanliness for reuse in the same or new applications. Uh, so they look, uh, and I'll use an example here. They will look at glass, for example, that it doesn't have any mercury residues on it. Um, Manufacturers uh, operating in maintenance guidelines must be strictly adhered to, and manufacturers develop these for a reason. They know the equipment, and it is, it is really um, you need to follow these guidelines and not take shortcuts and cost saving measures, and it needs to be strictly adhered to. Okay, uh, then this is the, the separate piece of equipment uh, to, the, uh, to the main lamp processor. This is a unit that is pre-processed, pre-preparation step for CFLs and small lamps. It crushes and separates the uh, CFLs and different lamps. So it removes the plastic uh, uh, components and the electronic components away from, um, away from the lamp. And then the rest of the lamp or fluorescent tubes are put through the automated lamp processor. You'll see over here is the lamp, the fluorescent tube lamp um, feeding point. Uh, this is a manual system uh, where fluorescent tubes are manually fed into the into the machine here. Um, and over here is the drum where your drums come in, and it's all automated here, where the drum is then turned into this hopper. Uh, it's opened by the machine and turned into this uh, hopper and fed through the system 
where it goes through a, a, a crush and separation uh, process. Uh, and this process, uh, this pipe comes along here, and uh, this over here is where your crush separation, you have metal separators, plastic, uh, if there's any residue plastics, and non-ferrous metals, and your glass, and your phosphor powder, all get uh, separated. The phosphor powder, these are the, the different drums for the various fractions. Um, the glass comes out over here into a big bag and it's been cleaned um, and uh, it comes out in a colored size of about one to four millimeters and I'll show you a picture of that later. Um, and then over here is your uh, bag filters for phosphor and, and your phosphor capturing uh, section and then your mercury recovery is in this section over here where all your mercury vapors uh, are captured um, in these uh, double uh, double um, filter banks over here um, to ensure that there's no uh, mercury vapor escaping. So this is just a very high overview of the of the equipment. Um, it is quite a little bit more involved um, in the technically and how it separates and cleans, but that is just a higher uh, overview for this purpose. And these are the separated lamp fractions. So you have your, um, your non-ferrous and ferrous metals. Uh, you have your glass color, as you can see it's very clean here. This is between one to four millimeters. The, the phosphor powder has been removed off of this glass. Uh, you have mercury that comes out in a pellet form. It depends on what uh, lamps you put, you feed through the through the system. It, uh, it recovers the, the mercury in pellet form, and then also the the end caps that come either from the fluorescent tubes or other small lamps are collected in the drums that you would have seen there. And these are non-ferrous metals. And over here, um, for the, I use the same drawing again, but your plastics and everything is separated uh, for your LEDs um, and your electronics. And then your phosphor powder is uh, is captured as it looks there. That's how it looks like. Um, it looks like flour, and it gets captured separately. And then your plastics. And then these raw materials can be further uh, uh, processed for further use, um, and I'll go into more detail there later. So your your ferrous metals, uh, plastic components, your phosphor powder, and your glass. Um, this is now the advanced processing. Uh, we do advanced uh, decrusion separation, and then we go into advanced processing or beneficiation or product manufacture. So the glass that you so over here, that glass is then further processed in um, a, a, pr a process that was designed by my colleague um, who designed this, uh, this technology to further process the glass and non-BFR plastics uh, through the system, which creates, uh, according to very uh, diff to different technical specifications, manufactures. Uh, glass product um, and plastic product and these products are now sold um, off into the marketplace where they are used in various applications and, and various other uh, making other products so this is sold as a product uh, from from the facility and that gentleman over there is our operations superintendent so that looks after the entire facility uh, then over here is another advanced processing step with beneficiation or product manufacture. There's an automated mercury recovery plant. So the mercury uh, containing material that has been uh, recovered from the uh, uh, crush and separation, such as your activated carbon pellets, they all contain mercury from capturing the mercury vapor. Uh, these all go through an uh, automated mercury recovery plant, and the mercury is recovered at 99.9% um, <clears throat> analytical grade <clears throat> mercury, which is sold 
um, through controlled processes uh, for reuse uh, in electronics or other materials. And then there's also advanced processing um, that can be done, which is the beneficiation product manufacture uh, of your, uh, your phosphor powder. And from your phosphor powder and your diodes from LEDs, you can recover rare earth. And the main elements in the phosphor powder targeted is the europium and yttrium. And the uh, yields are 98% yttrium and 92% europium, which is very valuable. So and then we were looking at low-tech dismantling options for lamps. There aren't many, um, uh, uh, this, this is not applicable for fluorescent uh, lamps that contain mercury vapors, but there are options for luminaires and lamp fitting. So they, you can do disassembly or dismantling of luminaires and lamp fittings. So the holder that holds the lamp, um, you would remove the lamp from the luminaire. So this is called a luminaire. It's in the technical term. And the lamps would then go to specialized treatment. But the, the, the luminaire or the fitting would be dismantled, and the plastic parts removed, and the, and the, the steel parts separated, and any wires cut off. Um, and any any uh, electronics, if there are any is, that are integrated with in the fitting, will be separated, and all of this can go off to various uh, uh, other applications for plastics recycling, metal recycling, and, and electronic. Uh, the PC boards would go to electronic into the electronic waste stream for recycling. Um, and then this is also an example of a, a fitting that is being dismantled and and um, pulled the part uh, to separate any wires or steel um, from any other components. So those can be done manually and they, they can be low tech dismantling options. And the lamp, as I said, would have to go to specialized treatment. Then this, this is also an option for LED lamps, not fluorescent lamps, uh, because fluorescent lamps have an immediate health hazard to the person. If it breaks, with LED lamps doesn't have that immediate health danger. So the manual disassembly of LED lamps um, would be the removal of the diodes and strips from the luminaires, the diodes and the light source to go to specialized treatment. So you'll see here that this LED, that the cover, plastic cover has been removed from the base over here. There's the PC board that gets removed. The um, the light sources on this um, on this holder uh, is removed. The metal heat sink, so this is there to dissipate the heat that the lamp generates, is removed. And that uh, the end over there is also removed. Um, and then the end caps are removed from the base. And the end caps are aluminium, which can be then go for um, recycling. The wires are cut off. So this is something that can be done manually. Um, it is, however, it is quite time intensive, and it is um, labor intensive because you get millions of these coming into a facility. But it is an option for a pre-processing or a small consolidation or a, a pre-processing um, facility in smaller areas. Uh, that can be done when not because the machines also can crush and separate this. Um, and then LED strips, which you'll find in your linear type uh, tubes, these can also be manually disassembled uh, or, or stripped. Um, and to, you can remove the, the the electronics, the, the printer board and wires and capacitors and so forth. And then you can remove the diodes, which is your light source over there, the little square. So this is a plastic cover and the, the plastic cover is taken off and the diode um, on the light source is re removed and that light source goes for specialized treatment. But again, it's also labor and time intensive, so one would have to really assess whether it's worth the while to do this. If you get small volumes in small facilities, it may be worth doing this. 
Okay, then I'm the, lastly, I'm going to look at the market viability for the output fractions. So, the typical market dynamics for lighting. You have your CFLs here and you have your LED lamps because those are, by volume, those are the highest uh, that are used worldwide. Um, the main components of lighting products have ne negative value. So you would need to invest in advanced beneficiation to create value. As you've seen in the previous slides, there was advanced processing beneficiation. Uh, investment had to be made to, con to, to treat the fractions further to create value for those fractions so they could be sold off as a product. This is important. You need to invest in advanced beneficiation to create value, and you need to be able to um, determine the cost-benefit analysis, whether it's worth uh, the investment. And it's also very volume dependent, and the type of lamp that you receive, uh, it's also dependent on that. But you can see here um, is the zero euro where LED is slightly above zero, where your mercury is lower, mercury lamps are lower in value. So the output fraction market value after treatment before beneficiation of product manufacturing, before we've invested, but this is just going to the crush and separation portion. Your steel is low value, your aluminium medium, other metals medium, plastic low, glass no value at all, nobody will take it in that form. Uh, phosphor powder, no one will take it in that form. Mercury, no one will take it uh, captured in, in a pellet, uh, in, a, in an activated carbon pellet, so it's got no value. Your electronics, medium, and your diodes, no value. But if you invest in the beneficiation product manufacturing uh, facilities, then you these become high value. So you have to force the value by investing. So plastic then become uh, medium because you are making a product that is reusable, um, easily reusable in um, in other applications. The glass, the value is very high uh, compared to um, uh, 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 on the glass trading market. It is very very high as you're creating a high value product, you know, a product that is highly sought after. Uh, the mercury, the value is high. As I mentioned, it's 99% uh, analytical grade um, because you've recovered it. And the phosphor powder is high because you've recovered elements, various elements out of it. The aluminium is also high because it has been cleaned and, uh, and has been cleaned of any uh, contaminants. And the electronics also high. You know, um, all your printed circuit boards uh, with, with a high volume can go into into uh, uh, recycling facilities where they can recover uh, various metals, high value metals, and then the diode is medium. And the diodes would be treated together with your, <coughs> your uh, phosphor powder. So those two would be treated in the same facility uh, because phosphor powder contains higher concentration of rare earth whereas the diodes contain lower concentration of rare earth. So your yields would be slightly lower, but you mix it into the phosphor stream and you would get value like that. Okay, that's 